Yeah. Thank you, the Most High King, for life. Thank you, the Most High King, for the life of my brother, Chief Meku. And um, for all of your lives, you take life for granted. Can't take um, this Torah for granted. We can't take each other for granted. We have to understand um, that we are each other's most valuable resources when we're in our right frame of mind. We, um, we sometimes like I was talking about this morning, we look for things from other people when we should be really looking for ourselves, within ourselves, right? We look at our failures or things that happen in our lives and we are quick to blame someone else but we don't look and reflect at ourselves and look at ourselves in the mirror and really understand that a lot of the things that are happening are because of us. It's not because of a teacher or your mother, your father. I mean, you know, sometimes people in your life have, um, they have an influence of what happens to you in your life, yes. But there's a point where you become a man and a woman where you know right from wrong and you have to discern right from wrong and do that which is right all the time. Because after a while, there is no excuse. There is no, you know, I did it. You know, what, you know um, how the commercial went? Where did you find this? Where, how, how did you uh, learn about this? I learned it by watching you, Dad. You know what I mean? That was the drug commercial. So after a while, you know, people get tired of the excuses and they want to see you, whether you could overcome certain things. Stop blaming others for your shortcomings and your failures. Look at yourself. And stop looking at people and thinking that people are going to do for you what you could do for yourself. You have to do for yourself. The Most High told us at the beginning, he said, by the sweat of your brow, you have to put in the work. If you don't put in the work, don't, ex don't um, expect results because results only come from the application of what you do and the work that you put in. That's how results come. And don't worry about failure because sometimes you got to get knocked down two, three times before you could get it right the third time. That's right. They said a righteous man falls seven times. He said, but he gets back up. That means in life, sometimes you're going to have failure. You know, when we was young, when, you know, before you really understood life in Torah, you know, you used to have guys that if a girl rejected them, they stopped. They don't want to talk to them. They'd be like in the corner, their hands in their pocket. And then you had guys that <laughs> if one rejected them, he figured by the tenth one, somebody going to say yes. <laughs> you know what I mean? So life is sort of like that sort of thing. You got to keep trying. You got to keep trying until it, until it works. Like, you open a business and you think the business is going to flourish as soon as you open it? No, you got to have money on the side for some rocky months. You got to advertise. You know that everything is not going to happen in one month or two months or three months. You almost got to save money for a whole year to be able to, all right, if, if I can't make it up from what I'm making from the business, I got backup because I believe in this plan. I believe that this is going to work. I know that the most high God is going to allow my hands to prosper. And when you have that patience and you put in the work, guess what? If results come out. It says the early bird gets the worm. All, all these sayings are just from the, from the Tanakh. You know, the early bird gets the worm just mean if you get out there earlier, if you, if you drive Uber, right? And you get out there earlier than everybody else, you're going to get the people going to the airport. Yeah. You're going to get the people. But if you a lazy guy, you drive Uber, and you wake up at 10 o'clock in the morning, you missed three airport runs. You missed all of that. You drive Lyft because people go to the airport early in the morning. They want to get to their destinations early so that they could enjoy the day. 
So you're going to catch the people going to Guyana, Trinidad, to the Caribbean islands. That's a $60, $65 trip all the time. But because you dedicated yourselves, you, you wake up early in the morning when you turn on the Lyft app or the Uber app, right there it is. You got a choice of somebody going to Kennedy Airport, somebody going to LaGuardia Airport. Hey, you even get more money if you go to Newark Airport. Say, so I'm going to go to Newark. I need that money. I need them 80-something dollars, 90-something dollars one trip. And guess what? The mo that's how God works with you. You in Newark. And now you got somebody that's in Newark coming back to New York. That's right. That's right. But because you got up early in the morning and you say, I'm going to apply myself to go out and get this worm like the early bird, right? Now you're going to get the results from that. And once you discipline yourself to walk in that manner, you're going to always get the worm. Why? Because you're applying yourself and you're disciplining yourself to become that. I've been watching the Olympics and I see, you know, these athletes are amazing and it amazes me what the human body could, could, um, could withstand, right? Because we see the glory, right? We see these people jumping and like great feats, but we don't see the down, right? The injuries, right? When you are an athlete, you get, that's part of it, baby. You're going to get injured torn knees and twisted ankles and all these things, the psychological aspect of it. I was looking at this um, young um, daughter, um, Simone Biles, who is the greatest um, gymnast, female gymnast that has ever done it. That's what they say. They say she's the goat. She even walk around with the little goat chain. You know what I mean? She got the little goat chain. But the last Olympics, I remember, she couldn't, she was afraid. And she was already the greatest gymnast at that point. She was, she, I, I, I was like, she abandoned her teammates, you know? But she came back to this Olympics and proved that, hey amen, if with perseverance and with trying and putting out that attitude, that you could get anything accomplished. I commend her for that because it's, a, um, it's not easy especially when you have doubt in your mind, somebody that was already the greatest at what she was doing had doubt. And we, and she was already great. Gold medals, um, national championships, world championships. She was already at 21 years old, 22 years old, acknowledged as the greatest gymnast ever already. And she went to those Olympics and she couldn't get on that ball without falling. Mm. Doubt. How much more so us, who don't have the pressure of the world watching you at that point. So you're going to have some mental things that happen to you. You're going to have things, self-doubt. But the thing is not about the self-doubt. It's how you overcome your perseverance. Whether when you get knocked down to the canvas, if you get back up. Or you stay down for the count like I give up. You can't give up in life. As long as you have the breath of life, you cannot give up. You have to keep striving forward and you have to keep moving because age is just a number. You can't get comfortable in a pocket and say, I'm too old to do that. No, 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 no. Right. If Abraham taught, thought that way, he wouldn't have the other life that he had way after 75. That's right. Abraham was 75 years old when God called him. He had a whole nother life. Had children, had all types of, bunch of children that he didn't even know. He just wanted one from Sarah. And after Sarah died, the Most High God blessed him with another wife. He had a whole other set of children. But if Abraham, if Abraham gave up on life, that's, you know, if he gave up on life, then what? So we can't give up on life. We can't give up on God. You got to keep striving and aspiring for, for greater things. You have to look for it. You have to want it. Sometimes the Most High God puts us in situations mm -hmm. in order for ourselves right. to be able to, to um, grow. But sometimes we look at it as, oh, man, this happened to me. No, God is putting you in a position to grow. Yeah. As young men and young women, you have to think about your future. Mm -hmm. What is going to be your future? 
Because the proverb says, it says, a little slumber, a little sleep. He said, and, yeah, and a little folding in the hand. The poverty comes like that. That's right. Because that's laziness. I'm a twist. I'm going to turn. I'll do it tomorrow. Procrastination is, is, is an evil. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to wait tomorrow. I'm going to do it. And we, we all got a little bit of that. I know I got it in me, procrastination. I'll do it tomorrow. I'll do it tomorrow. But the people who do a little bit here, a little bit there, little by little every day before you know it in a year, it's like, man, you did all that? Like, I never thought you would have been done with that. You're looking at a guy, he's building something, and every day he's putting up two, three pieces of wood, and then he leaves it. Then he comes back another day, puts up two, three more pieces. You're like, man, he's never going to be done with that. You come around six months, it's done. Because he or she, they didn't rush the plan. They went little by little at their pace. Sometimes all you could do is go at your pace. You go at your pace one step at a time. Here a little, there a little, God will bless your hand because you'll see your effort. That's right. Your effort is, is what it is. It's your effort. You can't stay in a rut. You can't look around, stay in a rut, and, and think that life owes you anything. God don't owe any of us anything. He gave us life already. What more do we want? And he commanded us to be obedient. Right? So... God doesn't owe us anything, but we owe him righteousness. We owe him, um, what do you call it, um, loyalty. Mm -hmm. That's what we owe him, praise. But he doesn't owe us really anything. God, God is magnificent to us every day that we wake up. Every day that we wake up. I was looking at um, something on Sports Center. Remember Steve McMichael? He was a football player with the foot with the Chicago Bears, but then he became a wrestler. I think he was down with like Hulk Hogan and them. What was the name of uh, when he when Hulk Hogan went to WCW? Mm -hmm. Forgot the name of that crew they had. But I was the, he was a big Hulkin man, six six, three hundred and something pounds, and the Most High God gave him ALS, mm. Lou Gehrig's disease. So this thing, little by little, deteriorates you. You start losing function of, your, of all your muscles. You can't move anything after a while. And last thing, after a while, you're, you can't even breathe. They got to put you on the machine. And your brain is working still the same because they're able to communicate with their eyes. So they have this machine that allows them to type with their eyes, and the machine speaks to you, and they're fully coherent, like mentally, everything is there intact. But the Most High God takes away their function and they look like somebody is just someone who's invalid, but they are really thinking and feeling the pain and they could tell you, I'm in pain right now. Mm -hmm. They could make jokes. They do all of that. So the Most High God decides. At the end of the day, he decides. So we have to make our, our life here on earth the best that we can Walk within the pattern that the Most High God has left here for us, which is the Torah, and do the best that we can do. Stop worrying about someone else's yard. Someone else's yard is their yard. You know what I mean? Their yards might be, the lawn looks great, green, right? But what do we learn from that? Sometimes where it looks, yeah, where it looks green, it's artificial. Because when, Avra, when Abraham asked Noah, um, Lot, mm -hmm. he said, nah. He said, we're not going to fight. He said, now, I'm going to let you choose which way you want to go. Lot chose the plush greenery that was full because he said, I have the cattle but Abraham had cattle too. You got rich because of your uncle. And, Ab and he left Abraham with whatever was left, which wasn't as great. What he thought. But when he went down there, he ended up in Sodom and Gomorrah. And everything that glitter is not what? No. 
When he was in Sodom and Gomorrah, they was trying to take his manhood. They was trying to take the, 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 the guests that came to his house. They said, come to our, they came to his door and they said, bring the man out so that we could know them. And that wasn't to find out what was their name, their age, and you know what I mean? How you doing, sir? What is your name? It wasn't about that. No one in a biblical sense. Yeah. Had some bubbers out there and some, yeah, some Jimbos. You know what I mean? We want to know him. Yeah, and then they said, because you want to protect them, we're going to deal worse with you. That's what they told him. We gave you a break while you was here. But now we're going to deal worse with you. So sometimes everything that glitters not gold. Like my mother-in-law said, you look at somebody's grass and it looks perfect. It might be artificial turf. <laughs> yeah, you might have a couple of weeds in yours that you could go pluck out. You know, sometimes they get out of control. You might get a, a wasp nest, you know what I mean, <laughs> that you got to cut down. <laughs> but it's okay. The little stinks here and there. You learn. But be happy with what you got. I'm not telling us that we can't grow. Right. Don't convolute my conversation with growth. We always want to grow. But when you have what you have, be happy. Because some people don't have anything. Some people don't have anything. We got, we got children. Thank God that you have children. Right? It's so important to thank God for your children because some people can't have you were able to. That's why this guy who's running for um, vice president with, um, with Donald Trump, J.D. Vance, he made a, he, he said something about people without children. Um, he basically called them like, like, um, like they shouldn't have a, um, a voice, basically, because they have no children and there's no way for them to to understand or, or to make rules and regulations. But that's so insensitive because some people can't have children. So therefore, now you're saying the person that can't have a child can't make a decision or wouldn't know how to love a child or understand certain things because they don't have children, which is false. You understand what I'm saying? Because it says that the Most High God makes a place for the eunuch and for the, and, and for the, 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 the woman that has no children. In his house, it says, her name should be greater. Or that man's name should be greater in his, before him. So let's thank God for what he's given us. Let us go to the 79th Psalm. We're in Psalm 79, starting from verse 1. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, yeah. The heathen are coming to thine inheritance. They have defiled thy holy temple. They have made Jerusalem into heaps. They have given the dead bodies of thy servants to be fooled unto the fowls of the heaven. The flesh of thy holy ones into the beasts of the earth. So this is so important. The psalmist I mean, here is um, it's a lamentation attributed to Asap, lightly written in response to a significant calamity that befell Jerusalem. I.e. the Babylonian captivity. So what we understand from the beginning of this psalm is a lot of times we think a sop. Now, there wasn't a sop that was during the times of David. But if this a sop is talking about the destruction of Jerusalem, this cannot be the same a sop during the time of David. We understand that the children of a sop also continued in the lineage and making songs and being singers in the temple as history went along. But this Asap during the time, the Asap during the time of David could not be this Asap because this Asap is talking about Babylon and the destruction of Babylon. So we know that that's way past. David didn't even see the construction of the temple. Mm. And this is talking about God, the heathen are coming to thine inheritance. They have defiled thy holy temple. Right. They have made Jerusalem into heaps. Mm -hmm. So this shows the, the blatant disregard of the, of the Babylonians. Because they went into what we consider the holiest place and they desecrated it, right? They defiled it. They defiled it by sacrificing um, unclean meats on the, on the altar. 
They defiled it by destroying it, by stealing all the goods that the temple had. This is, and they tore down the walls of Jerusalem mm. and the walls of the temple. They have given the dead bodies of thy servants to be food unto the fowls of the heaven. This also shows the, the blatant disregard that they had for people and for us because the one thing that a person should get after they die is a what? Proper burial. Right. To leave someone's body out in the open for the fowls of the heavens to eat them, it's a total sign of disrespect. Right. So these are all the things that are going on. The flesh of thy saints of the holy ones unto the beasts of the earth, the jackals, mm -hmm. you know, the wild hogs, those who clean up the earth. They have shed their blood like water round about Jerusalem with none to bury them. So they shed our blood so commonly that it was running like water within the streets of Jerusalem. That means that there was a total massacre. And if you hear, if you read about the Babylonian captivity, that's what it was. When Nebuchadnezzar came in there, when his generals came in there, they were killing everything. Right. And blood was running freely through the streets of Jerusalem. It was a massacre. They had, no dis they had no regard for the old, nor for the young. Mm. Let us go. We are become a torn to our neighbors, a scorn and derision to them that are round about us. So we are become a taunt to our neighbors, a scorn and a derision to them that are round about us. The Israelites find themselves mocked and ridiculed mm -hmm. by surrounding nations. Right. This verse reflects a deep sense of shame and the loss of dignity among the Israelites who are now scorned by those around them, further compounding their suffering. So the nations that are around us is scorning us, and they are further compounding our suffering, meaning it's like, it's like a taunt. Mm -hmm. They're laughing at us and looking at our calamity, looking down at us. So now we're seeing... Dead bodies being eaten by birds and by wild animals, right? And now they pouring salt into the womb and making it worse than what it is. So this is what's happening during this time, during the Babylonian captivity, mm -hmm. that the nations just don't care. Why? Because we're the chosen of the Lord. It's always been that way, that the people never cared about us. You look at us, you look at us now, the way that we are, people hate us. But they love us. Right. They hate us, but they love us. Look at, just like I spoke about Simone Biles, right? Mm -hmm. Gymnastics was a, was a lily white sport. Right. We had no access to sports like that. Mm -hmm. As soon as you get, I remember it was Dominique Dawes. Right. She was the first one in Atlanta that I remember. Mm -hmm. She influenced Gabby Douglas. Mm -hmm. Gabby Douglas influenced Simone Biles. And in three Black girls, Simone Biles became the greatest gymnast in the world. They hate us, but guess what? They have to give us our props. That's right. They showed how that girl created her own moves. She's only like four eight, four nine. She's a little something like this. And then they showed her leaping ability. They said she jumps higher than the male gymnast. When she gets to the height of her jump, and she twisted in the air, she's almost 12 feet in the air. Wow. The male gymnasts only get to 11. So that means she's flying. They said that's why she wins, because the, the level of difficulty of what she's doing, so even if she steps a little, they can't. It's only a minor thing you could take away, because the level of difficulty of what right. she's doing right. has never been seen before. and hasn't been duplicated. So it's so difficult that the moves that she's doing, they named them after her because no one, no one else has done it. That's how great we, we are. Back in the day, Althea Gibson, you know who's, who that is? Mm -hmm. That was Althea Gibson. That's her name, right? She was a Gibson, right? She was in the, she used to run in the, in the early 60s. She was an Olympic um, champion, the first black woman to go to the Olympics, represent the United States of America, and she won. She was born with polio. Polio was a, was a devastating disease back in the 40s and 50s. They didn't have a vaccine for it. So kids would develop it or they would, or they would be born with it, 
And basically what polio did is you, lo you, you lost strength in certain extremities, right? So sometimes you see like people, you ever see like some people walk like dragging their foot? Um, people that come from other nations and stuff. Polio been, it's been eradicated in the United States since the 50s and 60s. But some people in other third world countries, they don't have a, po a polio vaccine. So she was born with that. Through physical therapy and all of that, she used to have to walk with a brace till she was 10 years old. Then she got rid of the brace, started walking normal, and then became the greatest sprinter during that time in history. So that's the strength and the power of the Most High. Where they tell you you're not going to walk normal ever again, and God blesses you and makes you the greatest sprinter in the world. So nothing could stop you from if you put your trust in God, right? If you put your trust in God, and if mentally you will push yourself. I seen guys that they told them they were going to be paralyzed walking again. Normal. Walking. Why? Because they pushed their minds. They went through all the rigor. They went through all the toil and the pain. But if you lay down and say, I'm never going to walk again, you're never going to walk again. Why? Because you put it in your mind. The doctor told my mother, she said, when my mother had cancer, um, you know, it's a proven fact that people who believe in God get over these situations better than the non-believers. This is a doctor a si who believes in science. She said, do you have a higher power? She said, yes. My mother said, yes. Said, it's a proven fact that people that are faith-based get over these situations much better than people that do not believe in God. So there is something out there with believing in the Most High God that helps to heal your body. But if you don't believe in him, you by yourself. Mm -hmm. Talk to me. Talk to me. If you do not, right, Wilma Rudolph, that's her name. That's Wilma Rudolph, I had the wrong person. Yeah, Wilma Rudolph. 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 Y'all got to assist me here. Wimbledon. Wimbledon, that's yeah. what I got them confused Wilma with. Wilma Rudolph. Wilma Rudolph. It was Wilma Rudolph. Thank you. Somebody online here said, yes, it was Wilma Rudolph. Thank you mm -hmm. for the assist. Let us go, my brother. Verse 5. How long, O Yehovah, will thou be angry forever? How long will thy jealousy burn like fire? Said, so the psalmist is pleading with God and say, you're going to be upset with us forever? Mm. You know, how long will your jealousy burn like fire? Right. Because... It's like almost saying, you know, enough is enough. Here the psalmist questions the duration of God's wrath, pleading for an end to the suffering. The term jealousy refers to God's zealous protection of his covenant relationship, mm -hmm. which has seemingly turned to anger due to people's sins. Mm -hmm. This verse embodies a plea for mercy and acknowledgement of God's power control, to control their faith. Yeah, so jealousy burned like fire. This um, simile illustrates God's intense consuming anger, portraying it as an overwhelming force. So God's anger becomes an overwhelming force. Mm -hmm. And this thing right here, you know, when the psalmist is asking, how long will your jealousy burn like fire? You know, like enough is enough, God. Give us a break. Right. Right? Sometimes you feel that way like, I get it, God. I get it. Please give me a break. But even through that, you have to suffer through that to come out on the next side even better. Because when we do wrong, we're not thinking about God. And I don't want to sound like a prophet of doom, but when we in our wrong, we don't think about God. So now when God is exacting his punishment and getting his pound of flesh, then we have to be willing to accept the punishment and pray that God will have mercy on us so he don't take us up out of here. Mm. Let us go. Pour out thy wrath upon the nations that know thee not and upon the kingdoms that call not upon thy name. For they have devoured Jacob and laid waste his habitation. Uh -huh. Remember not against us the iniquities of our forefathers. Let thy compassion sweetly come to meet us, for we are very low. So now, 
the psalmist is pleading with God to redirect his anger now. Because right here it says, Verse 6, pour out thy wrath upon the nations that know thee not right. and upon the kingdoms that call not upon your name. Pour your, read that. All right, you got us, but now redirect this anger towards them and start touching them for what they've done to us. Start burning them up with some of that anger right. because we've had enough, y'all. Mm -hmm. So that's when God begins, the psalmist begins to turn the tables and upon the kings of that call not upon your name. The ones that don't worship the most high, the creator. Babylonians believed in their magic and in their falsehoods. Only reason we ended up there because God told us we was going to end up there. He said, get comfortable, build you houses, marry you wives. He said, and pray for the good of the city. Because you're going to be here a while. You're going to be here for 70 years. So don't start rattling and rebelling and talking about I'm gonna, we're going to create a riot because you're going to get killed. Wait for that time to work out because you're going to be here for a while. You got a 70-year bid. That's what they call it, a 50-year sentence, 25-year sentence. You keep appealing, appealing, appealing. You ain't getting nothing. You got to finish that out because that's what God has already established. And you can't, what God, what goes out, it don't come back void. And he don't change. He's not man that he should repent. That's right. Let us go. Verse 9. Help us, O God, of our salvation for the sake of, of the glory of thy name. And deliver us and forgive our sins for thy name's sake. You hear that? Help us, O God, of our salvation for the sake of the glory of thy name. And deliver us, for, forgive our sins for thy name's sake. Not for us, but right. for your name's sake. Right. Because you don't want the nations to say that their God cannot control them. Mm. Their God cannot, cannot um, cause them to do that which is right. Therefore, he had to destroy them. Mm. That's what happened with Moses too. Moses asked God, he said, listen, man. So what the surrounding nations going to say, y'all? He said, please. Allow us to have, show us some mercy. Mm -hmm. Let us go, continue. Wherefore should the nation say, Wherefore, where is their God? Where is their God? Let the avenging of thy servants' blood that is shed be made known among the nations in our sight. Said, let the avenging, it said, wherefore should the nation say, where is their God? God? They don't have a God. Right. Ah, uh, they, they soft. They don't got nobody protecting them. Right. When our God is the true and living God. He's the only God. And they got play play gods. They got Thor and, and Hercules right. and, and all these fictional characters. And we got the true and living God. They got the man hanging on the cross, but we got the true and living God. That's right. The one who delivers. Yeah, before wherefore should the nation say, Where is their God? Yah is always, he's ever present. He's ever present. It says here, let the avengers of thy servant's blood that is shed be made known among the nations in our sight. Read on, my brother. Let the groaning of the prisoner come before thee. According to the greatness of thy power, set free those that are appointed to death. Said, let the groaning of the prisoner come before thee. Mm -hmm. According to the greatness of thy power, set free those that are appointed to death. You ever see somebody who's sitting on death row? Right. Somebody who serving 25 to life? And they fight that case. You hear about these guys. They've been sentenced to 40 years, 50 years. They fight that case, fight that case. They don't go to prison and sit there and become involved in all the prison politics. Mm -hmm. They become involved in the law library. Right. And they begin to study. And when they go into the law library, they begin to study. And they study cases, cases that are similar to theirs. Right. And in studying them cases, they find loopholes. You find loopholes because when you go before a judge or you go before court, you could refer to an old case and the United States government versus Larry Jones. Mm -hmm. This is where the government was found at fault. I have the same type of case. And just by that technicality, 
Because president has been set, the government has to let you go. But if you go in there and you're playing basketball, you're in the prison politics, you in gangs, you and all that, you time is going to fly and you're not going to have time to do all that. They, they're very happy to, for you to feed that prison system, to keep making stuff for them for free and doing all that stuff. But if you go in there and you don't get involved in that stuff, and uh, hopefully we're not planning to be in prison, but those who go in there and don't do that stuff, and actually study their case and do that, they give all that time back. They come out after 15 years and they had a 50 year sentence. Yeah, so we are asking the most high God, said, let the groaning of the prison that come before thee, according to the greatness of thy power, set free those that are appointed to death. So although it seems like we are condemned to 25 to life, right? When we turn to God, he will set us free. We are condemned to death when we turn to the most high, he will set us free. We just have to trust in him. And we have to know that he will do it. Not believe, because in belief there is some doubt. When you say, I believe, and say, I believe he could do it, there's a little bit of doubt. But when you say, I know that he could do it, that's a different, whole different thing. Mm -hmm. So I'll leave it in the hands of God. I'm not even worried about that no more. God got my back. Yah got my back. That's the confidence we're supposed to have. Leave it in that shape because it says if, you, if you're praying, why are you worrying? That's right. And if you're worrying, why are you praying? Mm -hmm. Let us go. And render unto our neighbors sevenfold into their bosom. Their reproach, wherewith they have reproached thee, O To so all those that scorned us and taunted us, and said, render sevenfold into their bosom. Because they were laughing at our blood being poured out into the streets of Jerusalem, and said, Make whatever comes upon them even sevenfold more than what happened to us. We're not talking about soft people and people that right. pray for the, for the goodness of their enemies. You don't pray for the goodness of your enemy, never. Right. And no lifetime ever, you don't forgive your enemies. Your enemies is your enemies. That's it. Family, we fall out. We bump heads. Mm -hmm. We don't see eye to eye for a little bit. Mm -hmm. That's okay. That's family. We might not see eye to eye. That's not your enemy, though. Right. The enemy is those that for century and millennia and decades have proven to you that they're your enemies. Right. Right. And put stumbling blocks before you. And try to come against you. And put blocks right before you. We might not see eye to eye with each other for a little bit, but we're not each other's enemies. Right. We're family. And we all, and we all don't we got our little cliques, and we feel more comfortable with some people than others. But guess what? We still family. Yeah, we still family. But know who your enemy is. Learn to identify your enemy. And once you identify your enemy, from there, you move forward. That's right. Because come situations when we can't have doubt. Who this enemy is. Let us go. So we that are thy people in the flock of thy pasture. Who give thee thanks forever. We will tell of thy praise to all generations. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Because God will execute the judgment sevenfold upon those nations. And we're still here testifying that God is king. Even though our forefathers went through all that. We still here testifying that the most high God is king. Let us go. Let's finish this out. Psalms 80, for the leader upon Shoshanim, a testimony, a psalm of our side. So Shoshanim, Shoshan is like Susan. Like that translated as, as, the, as the name Susan. So Susan is a lily, which is basically a flower, any lily flower, which is like beautiful. It means like beautiful or pretty, right? For the leader upon Shoshanim, right? A beautiful flower, a testimony, a psalm of a sap. Let's get it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Give ear, O shepherd of Israel, thou that leadest Yosef like a flock. Who is the shepherd of Israel? Yah. Be confident. You know who the shepherd of Israel is. Yah. Let us go. Thou that art enthroned upon the kettle beam, shine forth. Before Ephraim and Benjamin and Manashi, stir up thy might. 
and come to save us. You see, so it says he he's enthroned upon the cherubim. What is it talking about, enthroned upon the cherubim? No, what, what's, what specific thing is it talking about? It says he's enthroned upon the cherubim. Where's the mercy seat on? On the tabernacle, right? It's in the tabernacle and it's in the box. In the what? In the ark of what? That's right. So he dwells, he said, thou that art enthroned upon the cherubim. Because the, the, the ark of the covenant has what on top of it? Two angels. The cherubim, right? Facing each other with their wings spread out. And in between that is the what? The mercy seat. So don't let, when you read Psalms, don't let it confuse you. Don't be like, man, what is it talking about? And you're just skipping through it. No, it's a, it's a meaning to all this stuff, right? So they're poetic. they just writing. It's like today somebody finds a poetic way to tell a girl that they love them. You know what I mean? When they write in, you know. That's all it is. Just that in today's time, people are straightforward. They don't, they don't use art to, to leave something to the imagination. Now it's straight to the point. Which is different than real artists, you know, like Smokey Robinson and them, you know. Mm -hmm. Them guys, you know, them guys is different. Mm -hmm. So, because they, they put their thoughts and their ideas more on paper, you know. I got sunshine on a cloudy day. When it's cold outside, I've got the month of May. I guess you say, what can make me feel this way? My girl. Right. You, you didn't know he was getting to my girl when he said, I got sunshine on a cloudy day. You know what I mean? But that's poetic. So poetry has been going on from the beginning of time. And all Psalms is, is poetry. And they, they express it in a poetical way for us to decipher it. But we understand it if we understand Torah. Let us go. Oh, Yah, restore us and cause our face to shine, and we shall be saved. And we shall be saved. Let's go. Oh, Yah, post. How long will thou be angry against the prayer of thy people? So how long will you be angry against the prayer of your people? Right? Because we don't want Yah to be angry with us forever. Where he's not listening to our prayers and he's rejecting everything that we throw, we send into him. We want him to be receptive to us. Am I right or wrong? We want the most high God to be receptive. So what do we have to do for those prayers? For God to be receptive to those prayers. Do that which is right. That's right. Let us go. That has fed them with the bread of tears and given them tears to drink in large measure. Uh-huh. Thou makest us a strife unto our neighbors, and our enemies mock as they please. Our enemies mock as they please. But the only reason that enemies are mocking is because of what we've done. Enemies wouldn't be mocking us if we did that which was right. All right, so there, there's, a, there's a form of a neglect by the Most High God because we're not really doing what we're supposed to be doing. So that's what I was talking about earlier when I said stop looking at other people and showing and, and trying to put what you've done on other people's shoulders. Mm -hmm. You have to reflect and look at yourself and say, I made the error. And correct the error. Because when you correct the error, then the Most High God won't be rejecting your praise. That's right. Let us go. Verse 8. O Yah, post restore us, and cause our face to shine, and we shall be saved. And we shall be saved. Because Yah is our salvation. Amen. O God of hosts, restore us. Right? Make us whole again. Because when we broken down, we need to be restored. And cause our face to shine. And we shall be saved. He's our only Savior. Amen. There is no other Savior but Yahweh. Yah is our only Savior. He's our only shield and our only protector. Right. Don't let anyone, don't let anyone fool you and make you think that there is any other Savior That's but right. Yahweh. He's the only Savior. I know they said that that man died and saved the world from sin, but that is a lie. I'm here to tell you that that is a lie. It has always been a lie. It continues to be a lie, and we should not fall for that. Right. Says here, he's our savior. Let's go. Thou just pluck up a vine out of Egypt. Thou just drive out the nations in this planet. Thou just clear a place before it, and it took deep root and filled the land. The mountains were covered with the shadow of it, and the mighty cedars with the bows thereof. 
She sent out her branches unto the sea and her shoots unto the river. And her shoots unto thou didst pluck up a vine out of Egypt, thou didst drive out the nations and did us and, and did us plant it, thou didst clear a place before it, and it took deep root and filled the the land. The mountains were covered with the shadow of it, and the and and the mighty cedars with the boughs thereof. She sent out branches unto the sea and her shoots unto the river. Go ahead. Chapter. Why hast thou broken down her fences, so that all they that pass by the way do pluck her? Uh huh. The boar out of the wood doth ravage it; that which moveth in the field feedeth on it. So that branches us. That mm -hmm. all these things is happening. So the psalmist is saying, "Why you, you plant us, and our roots went out to the river, and we're flourishing, but you left us unprotected. Why did you leave us unprotected, so that when the nations came about, they could do what they want to do with us?" So this is what the psalmist is asking the creator. Let's go. O Yah of hosts, return we beseech thee. Look from heaven and behold and be mindful of this vine. Uh -huh. And of the stock which thy right hand hath planted. Uh -huh. And the branch that thou hast thou made strong for thyself. The branch which thou hast made strong. Be, be mindful of us. This is what the psalmist is asking the most high God. Be mindful of us, your people. This is the prayer that we should have all the time. Y'all, please be mindful of us. Even when we have situations, y'all, please be mindful of me. Be mindful of my family. Be mindful of my loved ones. Please protect me. Because God left the fence down because of our own actions. Once again, it goes back to, to self-accountability. You have to be accountable for your own actions. Mm -hmm. You can't blame it on anyone else. Why you're not feeling... You, we're not spiritualists. We're not here to give you spirituality. Right. We're not spiritualists. That's a, that's a Christian concept. We're not spiritualists. We're here to teach you Torah. That's what we're here for. The priests, we don't have priests operating in the midst of us. You learn Torah and you have to walk in it. We're not spiritualists. That's why God tells us, don't put your trust in man because man is flawed. And if you start believing and thinking that man could help you and save you, then you become flawed just like that person. Because you're waiting on that man's word and that man's word is going to determine everything that you do. When they could be wrong as two left feet. Or that woman. That's right. We're not spiritualists. Don't come here for spirituality. You understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Don't come here for We get our spirits uplifted or our ruach uplifted because we praise y'all. Mm -hmm. But don't look. Don't come here for some mind massage like <laughs> some, we're going to sit in the yogi position and we're going to massage your spirit. We're not, we not here for that. You got to find out within yourself. You have to find peace within yourself. Not... People are not here to sugarcoat things. Mm -hmm. You can't sugarcoat the laws of God. Right. Last week I showed you how God, by Pinchas executing judgment, he got an everlasting priesthood. Right. That wasn't a spiritualist mm -hmm. session. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? That wasn't somebody massaging someone's spirit. It was a spare going through two monkeys. Right. And God was like, yes, that's my boy. <laughs> Love that guy. That's what God did. People, they come, you come here and you're looking for like a pie in the sky. You, it's the same Christian mentality. You're not going to get that. Everybody, listen, through the years, people have had their favorite teachers. That's from when I was growing up. You got your favorite guys that come up, man, that's my guy. Mm -hmm. Chief Uzzah might not be your favorite guy. I get it. Might be Chief Meku. It might be Moray Rani. It might be Samal Zakar. It might be Chief Benyamin. That's all right, as long as you get the lesson. But guess what? We have to sit down through all them teachers, and I got a little bit from each one of them. So if you refuse to listen to the teacher, you might miss something that's for you. We used to have, <laughs> we used to have one. Young brother, because some teachers have nervous tax. Mm -hmm. So your nervous tax sometimes is words that you keep repeating, repeating, repeating. Mm -hmm. I have them. Every, kind of everybody has them, mm -hmm. right? 
But this teacher was kind of like, he did, that nervous tack was on, on, on steroids. And there used to be, when we was young, one young brother used to sit down and take notes of how many times he said that word. So one week it'll be like 70 something. The next week it'll be like 100. And we used to laugh, but we learned from that teacher. Even with that nervous tack and us like thinking something was fun because we was young and didn't really understand. We learned a lot and we continue to learn. Because we sat through it. We thought it was laughter and fun at first. But guess what? As we grew, we understood the importance of the teacher. We understand the importance of each one of us. So you can't say, ah, I don't like him. I'm, I'm not listening to him. I'm not listening to her. That's not my cup of tea. You have to listen to everybody because you don't know where your message might come from. You go to school, you have professors that you... I used to have teachers that I hated. Mm -hmm. But guess what I had to do? I had to sit there so I could pass that class. Right. And then at the end of it, when you look back at it, it said, man, he was just trying to help me. Mm -hmm. There was one teacher, man, he used to push me so much. And I used to be like, man, I'm tired. Why are you picking on me? Mm. Like, <laughs> I'm already in a good class. I'm on the, on the basketball team. I'm... You know, I'm playing baseball. Why are you picking on me? And I'm getting good grades. And then he told me, like, you, could, you have so much more potential, but you just do enough just to get by. Mm. Yeah, he told me, you got so much more potential, but you just do enough to get by. And it was true. I was just trying to get by the classes, hide in the back of the classroom, you know, do enough to just write something and turn it in. He was like, you got so much more potential. I'm not going to accept this from you. Rewrite this. I'm like, what? You said a two-page story. I did that. No, 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 no. That was just a suggestion. You got more. I need you to write more. And I used to be like, I hate this guy. But at the end of that class, he was right. He was like, you have much more potential. So sometimes people are looking at you, teachers are teaching you, and they see the potential in you, but you are rejecting it. And if you reject it, you will never know. Let us go. Let's finish out. It is burned with fire. It is cut down. They perish at the rebu rebuke of thy countenance. Let thy hand be upon the man of thy right hand, upon the son of man whom thou madest strong for thyself. Mm -hmm. So shall we not turn back from thee, Quicken thou us, and we will call upon thy name. O Jehovah of hosts, restore us, cause thy face to shine, and we shall be saved. And we shall Hallelujah. be saved. Hallelujah. O Jehovah of hosts, restore us, make us whole again. Mm -hmm. Cause thy face to shine, and we shall be saved. All honor, all glory, all Amen. praise to the mighty King, Jehovah of our We thank the Most High God that he has brought us to this point. I thank the Creator for this day. And I pray that the Most High God will bless us all. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.